Hello and welcome to Love Thy Lawyer, where we talk to real lawyers about their lives in and out of the practice of law, how they got to be lawyers, and what their experience has been. I'm Lewis Goodman, the host of the show, and yes, I'm a lawyer. Nobody's perfect. Today we're very happy to have Ernie Castillo with us. He's a lawyer, he's been practicing in Alameda County for quite some time and handles serious cases. Ernie, welcome to Love Thy Lawyer. Thank you, Lou. It's a, it's an honor to be here with you on this podcast. It's my first podcast and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Well, uh, I'm very honored to have you on the program, uh, especially considering some of the cases that uh, you've handled. We'll talk about that a little bit later. First of all, let's just start here. Where is your office located? I have an office in Oakland. It's on uh, Washington Street down by Jack London. It's a small little office. I rent some space there. Um, I've been out in Oakland practicing for about, I don't know, 17 years or 18 years now. And what kind of practice do you have? I do criminal defense only. Uh, most of my practice consists of homicide cases out here in this county. I have some other types of criminal cases that I've that I'm dealing with currently, but for the most part, it's it's mostly murder cases. Where are you from originally? I grew up in San Francisco. I was born in the city, went to high school out there, went to college, went to law school. I moved out to uh, Oakland, I think, in two thousand nine. 2008. But yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a city kid. I understand your parents uh, were immigrants from El Salvador. Yeah, they have an interesting background. Both of my parents uh, met in America, but they were uh, originally from El Salvador. My mother comes from sort of a middle class family out there. My father uh, was a working class guy. Uh, he grew up primarily with his mother. His father, though, was the my grandfather was the president of El Salvador in between 19, I think, 61 and 1962. Uh, you know, he was he formed a coup that took the country over. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting background. My parents came here separately and they met here in America. So this fighting spirit is well within your DNA. It is definitely deep rooted in my in my DNA. Absolutely. Did you go to high school in San Francisco? I did. I went to Reardon High School. Um, it's uh, it's a, I guess I called it a Catholic school. Um, but uh, yeah, I grew up in, in San Francisco. I think it's called Archbishop Reardon now. I think they just went co-ed. It was the last high school in San Francisco to be all boys until this year, this school year, where they will be opening it up to girls as well. What was your experience like when you went there? You know, I went to uh, Reardon seems like a long time ago. Um, it was a mostly working class school. So there were these three, you know, Catholic schools in the city that kind of all competed. It's SI, Sacred Heart, and Reardon. And Reardon was definitely on the lower totem pole of the, of the spectrum there between those three schools. Mostly a working class uh, school, predominantly Latino, Asian, and, and African American. Um, and it was, you know, it was, it was kind of rough. It felt like a high school to, to be honest with you, but it was definitely a good bonding experience amongst guys. It was like a locker room, uh, interaction every day. Sports was a big deal. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was good. It's definitely a lot of, uh, life experienced experiences that were learned there. Did you play a sport there? I played a little bit of football. I played primarily baseball. I was a big baseball player. So I played baseball all four years. And then uh, I was a catcher, actually. So I loved calling calling the games. I loved uh, being part of the strategy of, of the game. Uh, so we had a lot of fun. And when you're a catcher, you're always in the game. You're not standing around waiting for the ball to come to you. That's right. Always in the game. Always strategizing against batters. Uh putting on calling the defense and all that. It was great. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. When you got out of high school, you went to uh, San Francisco State. Is that right? Yep. San Francisco State. I kept it local, kept it working class, um, and uh, went to SF State, graduated in uh, social sciences with a minor in criminal justice. 
And uh, it was a great school. I had a lot of, I had a good time there. I, I developed a very strong bond with the director of the criminal justice program there. His name is John Curtin. And he kind of took me under his wing there, try to help me get out of the working class uh, background I had and try to push me into law school and make me a professional. And so he took me under his wing, uh, exposed me to, to the law, got me into law school and, and, and the rest is history, I guess. So is that when you first started thinking about becoming a lawyer? I did. That was the very first time I was in, I was in, uh, I was at SF state studying in the criminal justice program. One of the classes there was focused on criminal law. We reviewed like cases, things like that, U.S. Supreme Court cases. And that really sparked my interest um, and got me into thinking about going to law school, becoming a lawyer, and trying to figure out kind of what, what I would do if I had become a, an attorney. Where'd you go to law school? I kept the local again. I, I stayed at Golden Gate University here in San Francisco. Um, and I loved it there. The professors were great. They were very good. Um, very personal with students. They were very uh, available, and I, I thought it was great. It was it was a great time there. It sounds like mentors have been very important to you in mapping out your career. Yeah, they have. I'd say it started it started with San Francisco State guiding me towards law school. Um, once I, I went through law school, um, you know, I, I think it was my first or after my first or second year in law school. I hooked up with the San Francisco Public Defender's Office as an intern. I had a, a trial attorney there uh, who kind of took me under his wing and really exposed me to the work of a public defender and a criminal defense attorney. And one of the emphasis there at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office was trial work, courtroom work. And so once I got there, my the guy that was that I was working for essentially just threw me into that courtroom doing preliminary hearings, motions to suppress, 995 motions, whatever, you name it, just to get me in there uh, so I can get a feel for what that was like, for sure. And then, and then when I was done with uh, law school, I, I started in private practice right away in San Francisco. Uh, and I, I worked with a guy named, I shared office space with a guy named Joe O'Sullivan, who's still practicing out there. And he was a big trial guy as well. And so he had this culture of going to trial and everything. He handled big cases. And I learned a tremendous amount uh, about trial work being alongside Joe O'Sullivan. And from there, I just, everything about my connections in the field really centered around trial work. So when I got to Oakland, um, working out here, my mind was pretty set on doing trial work. I want to come back to that in just a minute. But first, I'd like to ask you, what did your friends and family say or think when you expressed to them an interest in going to law school, becoming uh, a lawyer? Yeah, you know, my so my friends growing up were, were guys who uh, who are now are either just, you know, they, they do a lot of different types of work. They're police officers, they're firemen, they're delivery guys. They do a lot of different working class jobs. And only a couple of us ended up doing legal work. Um, and so when, when I took the route of trying to become an attorney, I think it was a shock and a surprise to most of my friends and people who knew me. Um, but it, it was something that I felt like if I could make it into the legal community, I felt like I could go back and work in the sort of environment that I grew up in and try to do some work for people in that, in that scene. So, uh, it was definitely a big surprise for not only my friends, but especially my parents, um, who had, you know, no real, um, expectations for me to ever become a professional. Not that they didn't want me to, but it just wasn't really in the, in the works really. But so, yeah, so it, it just kind of worked out that way. Uh, there was a lot of ambition behind it and a lot of dedication. As a matter of fact, your brother's a San Francisco police officer. Yeah, he is. He's a police officer in San Francisco. Uh, we actually talk every day and we give each other a hard time every day. So <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> yeah, we have a good time. Oh, that's great. Um, so speaking of trial work, you know, you're you really have a reputation in Alameda County as someone who tries tough cases, 
goes to trial, is prepared for trial, has had a lot of success at trial. Um, I, tell me a little bit about your notion of the work that you do. Yeah, so, you know, I I think it starts with why I'm a defense attorney, really. Uh, you know, for the way I see things from my perspective, from my, my background, uh, I really enjoy helping the underdog. Uh, I feel like people in the criminal justice system have, have gone through a, um, difficult times trying to survive. Um, they are definitely going through a system that has been considered by a lot of people, especially during these times as an oppressive, biased system. Uh, and I think they are underdogs in a lot of different ways, economically, um, especially. And I think those guys need the most help. And those are the people that, honestly, Lou, I, I have a connection to just because of I feel like I'm connected to. Those are the type of people that I grew up with, you know, these working class guys having a hard time making mistakes, getting caught up in the system. I grew up around that. So I definitely have a, a, a passion for representing people in that situation, for representing the underdog. Um, and and I, I have this big dedication to that. At least that's how I see it, see myself. And that's what motivates me. And so when I stepped into this criminal defense arena, I think the maximum or the most impactful or influential thing I can do as an attorney is to do trial work at the most extreme in the most extreme way possible, which is going to trial on murder cases, sex cases, things like that. I see people charged with murder and sex cases as the most uh, outcasted group amongst defendants. Uh, they are the people that need the most help. They are the people that are hated the most by society, and I think they need the most help. So I, I, I enjoy representing that underdog in that scenario in that boxing ring. And so I, you know, that's that's how I have ended up doing trial work and doing uh, uh, murder cases and sex cases for sure. As a matter of fact, you said to me when we talked about doing this podcast just before we actually started recording that you have a jury out right now on a murder case and that we might need to interrupt this conversation if the <laughs> court calls and says they need you back in court. Yeah, I do. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a murder case in Oakland. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, anyone's worst nightmare. It's a, a robbery at gunpoint with a kidnap, uh, brutal beating, uh, and torture person was bound, driven up to the Hills in Oakland and assassinated up there, shot in the head three times. Um, there's some interesting issues in the case. We started the trial back in, I, I think I want to say February or January of this year. We were in we were in actual evidence in the case in March. We were scheduled to do closing arguments March 17. And then the COVID-19 pandemic struck. The shelter in place orders went into effect. The courtrooms shut down. And we had a pause since, nine, since March 17, all the way up to, I guess we went back June 23rd, a couple days ago. Uh, so there's been a delay of, a, of over a hundred days just waiting for us to do a closing argument on this thing. So uh, it's been a, a hell of a roller coaster dealing with that. You know, most of us have a notion of what a courtroom looks like. I mean, I mean, I, I certainly do as an attorney. I think, you know, everybody sort of thinks of it as there's a, a judge sitting on a bench. There's a jury sitting on one side of the courtroom. There's counsel tables. Uh, what does the courtroom look like uh, in a jury trial with the coronavirus situation going on? Well, it's uh, it it had a the way it looks now. It, it had a long road to get to where it is today, and where how we did our closing arguments this week. When the pandemic struck, everything was on pause. Everyone was trying to figure things out. Eventually, there was a push by the Alameda County uh, system to have us finish this trial on some type of remote platform, basically stripping us from having to show up into a courtroom physically and, and finishing this thing up. 
it was proposed to us to try to have the jury even deliberate remotely amongst themselves. Um, and I, you know, we fought, I fought tooth and nail against that. I was not going to agree to that at all. The, the county put plexiglass around the witness box, witness box. They created a plexiglass box uh, that surrounds a podium for us to stand in and do our closing arguments. So it was wow. a very unusual experience. Uh, as soon as you walk into the courthouse, there's stuff everywhere marking how far to stay away from people. When you get into the hallways, there's markings everywhere telling you how far to stay away. And when you entered our courtroom, there were signs all over the seats about where not to sit, where to sit, and all that. It was It's a complete nightmare. It felt like you were walking into a danger zone. Um, Just out of curiosity, who's the judge and the DA that you're working with in this case? It's uh, Judge McCannon and the DA, Stacey Pettigrew. Do you have some sense of uh, how they're going to handle deliberations? So um, they're in deliberations right now. The judge decided to give them the courtroom that we did our closing arguments in. So the judge will be out of that out of that completely. He won't use the chambers in that courtroom. The clerk and court reporter will be gone. The sheriffs or the deputy in the courtroom will be sitting outside the door to the courtroom, and they're going to give the, the courtroom to the jury to, to use for deliberations. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. You've you've tried a lot of cases. Do you have some sense of how many? Uh, well, let's start here. How many serious cases you've tried? Gosh, I don't even know. You know, I, I probably it's a total guess, but I would say for just murder cases alone, probably about twenty or twenty five. Wow. Um, and then you know I've tried sex cases and every other everything else in between, all the way down to misdemeanor. So. I don't know. I'd say maybe 35, 40 cases total, maybe, is my guess. Now, you're also bilingual, aren't you? Yes, I speak Spanish. Well, I had a case that was a very serious case that um, my client left me and hired you, uh, and in large part because you spoke Spanish and they felt very comfortable talking to you. And I was I was very frankly happy that they that they. They did take you on uh, as their attorney because I I think that uh, they they did feel comfortable and the client felt comfortable talking to you. And very frankly, I'll let you know, uh, in that case, it was originally charged as a murder and you got him a very good manslaughter disposition on that case. Yeah, I think we ended up resolving it for for a midterm on a manslaughter. And uh, yeah, I think so. The client was very happy about that. Some of the that incident was actually on video. And photo right. and stuff. So right, sure was. Yeah, I was. I was really very happy about the way the whole thing turned out. And thank you. Yeah. Um, if uh, if if a young person was thinking about a career in law, would you uh, recommend that they do that? <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know if I would, <laughs> Lou. I don't know. Uh, okay. It's not. Why in, uh, well, I, I should say my my. Um, career and what I do, it's not as glamorous as you might imagine it going into it. You know, it's, uh, I know that it, it's not like a, uh, it's not like a, a movie that you watch about lawyers. So it's definitely a grind. Uh, it's hard work. It is hard work. Um, yeah. and sometimes, especially in criminal defense world, people don't like you, especially with the kind of cases I deal with, you know, sometimes people hate you for representing a murderer or somebody who killed the child and things like that. So it's, you got to have some thick skin to do this. You know, I, I would definitely recommend it if they got that skin. for. Well, how is it, how is practicing law met or differed from your original expectations about it? To be honest with you, Lou, I don't really think I had any expectations going into this. I, I didn't really know much about going to law school or any of that stuff. Do you think the system is fair? Do you think it dispenses justice? The system has definitely evolved into a system that reflects, I would say, more than anything, a class bias and all, certainly racial concerns. And I think that. Uh, that is definitely something as a trial attorney, I have to be conscious of when I walk into a courtroom and I'm trying to pick a jury. I need to understand 
what my client looks like to society, what people are thinking about him, uh, and how members of society are going to look at this particular case. So I can't be, I can't bury my head in the sand about issues like that when I'm thinking about a case. Are you seeing any more diversity in the jurors? I I do. I do see a lot more diversity in in the jurors. You know what I and I'm, I'm not just and I'm not just talking oh in part, but I'm I'm not just talking about racial diversity, but kind of diversity in thinking. I think so. You know my concern, Lou, on these kinds of cases that I see a lot is is you can get a very socially conscious juror show up to a case uh, and will sh- scream out and say, hey, you know what? I think the system has problems. I think people are biased in the system. I don't like cops, whatever it is. And they say that, and then they get themselves off of a jury panel. How about your uh, your family situation, your family life, and uh, and how has uh, practicing law affected all of that? Well, uh, you know, I'm lucky. My wife... Uh, we used to all work together at the place I used to work at before I went into my own private practice a few years ago. Is she an attorney as well? No, she's not. She was like a legal assistant there. So she, she knows the ins and outs of the criminal defense business uh, and sort of what needs to be done. So she helps me out. She's kind of my right hand. Do you have kids? I do. I have two kids. Uh, they're nine and seven. Oh, that's great. Um, and so it's a, it's a fun age. So I try not to miss you know, um, their, their activities and things like that, uh, despite being in trial all the time. And, you know, trial takes a lot of time and a lot of work and effort. What other things do you like to do? Any travel, recreational pursuits? Uh, you know, if I wasn't an attorney, Lou, I'd be a, I'd be a musician. <laughs> really? I love, I love playing guitar. Well, let's say you had a magic wand. You could change one thing in the world, legal or otherwise. What, what would that be? Uh, I think I would change economic inequity. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with the root cause of, of a lot of the, uh, social problems that we see in our world and in our life. So I would say economic inequity. Let's say you came into some real money, a couple of billion dollars somehow. (laughs) What if anything would you do differently in your life? In my life? Well, first of all, yeah. I'd probably quit practicing law <laughs> okay. for sure. Um, I would definitely try to use that money to fund grassroots organizations who are out there working with the people who need the most help. So you'd be a ph- philanthropist. Yes, I guess you can come say that. Yeah. Ernie, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. Thanks so much for coming on the pod. I've really enjoyed our conversation. I think I've learned a few things. And thanks so much for being here. All right. Thanks, Lou. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us today on Love Thy Lawyer. Special thanks to Ernie Castillo, Joel Katz for music, Brian Madison for technical support, and Tracy Hart. Please rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts. I'm Lewis Goodman.